So if Australia's 50 different macropods, the most famous and the biggest is this guy here, the red kangaroo. So stick around guys, we're talking with what's probably the king of all marsupials. G'day, g'day. It's Nick here and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. And today we're at Wildlife SA on the eastern side of Adelaide. And this guy here is a red kangaroo. He's the biggest species of marsupial left on earth today. And he's an emblem of Australia. You can't think of Australia or see Australia in a movie without thinking of red kangaroos. And this is what we want to have a talk about today. So these guys are found throughout central Australia, anywhere it's arid, semi-arid, heathland, woodland. These guys have to be built tough for where they live. They live in environments that are regularly over 40 degrees, the best part of the year round on a daily basis. We wouldn't survive out there for more than a couple of days without water and these guys do really, really well out there. They do it with a whole variety of adaptations. For a start, we've found that the fur on their back can reflect as much as 30% of the body heat that would be absorbed by them. So they're efficient in that regard. They've got efficient kidneys, so they don't waste any water, uh, you know, urinating more than they have to, like something that lives out coast on the, uh, out east on the coast. They're designed for this environment. On top of that, their habits. These guys structure their day around when it's cooler. So during the day, they'll silk shelter, like the trees and bushes behind me, and they won't just sit on the earth where it's hot. They generally scrape away a couple of inches, and just an inch or two underneath the surface of the sand, it's cooler, and they'll lie on that. So these guys are all about conserving energy, making their life as efficient as possible to take every advantage of they can in this pretty harsh environment. The other thing that these guys have done is they've taken their size to, to the max. Desert animals often go one of two directions. You either get smaller, so small that you can live off very little resources and occupy a very small area. These guys on the other extreme have gotten to a size where if there's no resources left in their area, they have the ability to move a long distance. They've been recorded over the course of a few months traveling 1300 kilometers to seek better grounds, better pasture, better places to live. So they can travel large distances, which a smaller animal simply wouldn't be able to do. Despite this ability to cover massive distances, when times are good, just like most animals, they're homebodies. They generally live within a 30 kilometer range of where they sleep, where they live, and uh, they only want to move out when the resources don't meet them staying there. There's no point in moving around unnecessarily. When they do have to be on the move, just like all kangaroos, they use this hopping gait. And hopping is an incredibly energy efficient way of getting around. Once they're actually going, it works kind of like a pogo stick. Their weight is pushing on those tendons, so the next spring off, they're not pushing so much, is bouncing off the, uh, the acceleration that's caused by the last step. So it's an incredibly efficient way to go. It means that these guys can outrun uh, their most common predator, which would be the dingo. Once they get going, they're only using a very small portion of the energy that a dingo has to do to do the same, dis uh, same speed. So these guys can outlast him in that hot, dry environment on a long chase. Now, just like a lot of our other macropods, these guys are attached to this boom and bust cycle, and it's nowhere more prevalent than where they live, out in the center of Australia. So just like a lot of macropods, these guys have an int a re interesting reproduction. They have what we call embryonic diapause. So these guys mate about two days after they give birth. So the baby that climbs into the pouch, uh, it's born like ties of a peanut. Barely any arms, almost no legs. It's blind and it crawls its way into the pouch. About 24 hours later, mum mates again, and she pauses that embryo at about 100 cells because she doesn't want to have two in the pouch at the same time. So once she does reactivate that little embryo, they have about a 33 gest day gestation. Then that baby will in turn crawl up to the pouch, but this won't happen until the joey in the pouch either leaves and becomes at foot young, or well, if for some reason it dies off, like there's drought, there's not enough food to keep lactating. So it means that these guys always have a plan B. They can try and have a couple of attempts to reproduce when the environment allows. Once that joey is born, it spends about 200 days in the pouch, which is a pretty long time in the scheme of marsupials. <laughs> and it's not independent until it's between 12 and 18 months of age. It takes a little bit longer before they're gonna be reproductive, but a male, he's gotta go out and put on a little bit more size because the males actively compete for the right to reproduce. So while a girl can reproduce once she's able to, a boy has to be able to fight off the bigger boys. And if you've guys seen these on every documentaries on television, these guys are the bodybuilders of the marsupial world. They get big shoulders, big arms, and they box with each other. It's a pretty amazing sight to see. While these guys are generally too big for the vast majority of predators left in Australia, dingoes will take them from time to time. Wedge-tailed eagles have been known to take joeys. But it wasn't too long ago, in geological time anyway, 
that these guys had a whole heap of predators. Things like marsupial lions. We had Tasmanian tigers on the mainland. We had Megalania, a six metre long goanna, the size of a crocodile and as fast as a horse. So these guys have evolved in an environment on big open plains where they've always had to have a watch out for predators. And because of that, you'll see their ears. As we're talking, their ears are like sonar dishes. They're always moving around, keeping an idea of where we are. And their vision is also amazing. They've got 300 degrees of vision. So out on these open plains, they can see something approaching from pretty much any angle. They're really designed for life in these wide open spaces, which is the vast majority of the center of the country. While these guys are really prevalent in some areas in big numbers, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that these guys are found everywhere in huge numbers. These huge numbers of mobs of 1,500 or more are usually a result of lack of resources elsewhere, and they've had to converge on somewhere that's able to support them. Just like flying foxes, other macropods, it's, we can't use that as a representation, an idea that we need to maybe colour eradicate one area. We've got to look at everything as a whole and manage it holistically. Because these guys are an Australian icon. We can't have Australia without red kangaroos. Now with that being said, I hope you've enjoyed meeting the biggest marsupial in the world and uh, our wallaroo ring-in. If you want to know more about the wallaroo, check out our other video on what are wallaroos. But between now and then, I hope you've enjoyed the video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to us on Facebook, uh, YouTube, all those kinds of things. And if you want to uh, do us a big favour, head on over to Wildlife SA on Facebook. That's the facility we're at today. And give them a shout out for letting us come and film here. The last thing that you can do is if you want to see more of these videos, see us get out in the field more and visit more amazing places, check us out on Patreon because those are the contributions that make all this possible. I'll leave it at that, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video and maybe learned a couple of things about some of our Australian icons. But between now and then, I will see you next week. In the meantime, be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care. There's a lot in one place. It's because I had to leave the other places. And unfortunately, <coughs> I just followed a fly. So, so well.